My name is Jeff Fair. I have a PhD in material science and engineering from the University of Minnesota. I have a BA in physics from Brigham Young University. I've worked with uh, solid state reactions. I've worked uh, um, characterizing materials, uh, ma semiconductor materials, thin films. Uh, I currently do a lot of work with uh, nanoparticles as well as uh, solid state reactions. The way I got involved in 9-11 research was about in 2005. Uh, I had read Steve Jones' paper on, uh, his initial paper on why the buildings collapsed that day. Um, to give you a little background, on, on the day of 9 uh, on September 11th, um, I was actually in Albuquerque um, waiting to, I had an appointment to, on, uh, at Sandia National Lab, which is part of Kirtland Air Force Base. And that morning, uh, a colleague of mine knocked on the door and said, as I was getting ready, he said, uh, a plane just flew into one of the Trade Center towers. And I thought, that's strange. And continued to get ready for our appointment. A um, little while later, he came back and said, a second plane flew into the towers. And then I thought, okay, this is not just your ordinary news day. Something's going on. So I went out to the lobby of the hotel, and, we, and people were uh, watching the news. We all watched what happened. Um, obviously, the base, uh, Sandia is part of Kirtland Air Force Base, so um, we knew that we weren't going to be getting on the base that day. And sure enough, the base had locked down. No civilians were going in. So we got a car and drove back to Salt Lake City. So the news of the, the, or the remainder of that day is a little hazy for me uh, because I wasn't sitting in front of the TV watching the news. And I wasn't aware of Building 7 until I read a Steve Jones paper in 2005, which talks about Building 7, talks about the strange uh, details and evidences of, uh, surrounding Building 7. And that's what really um, grabbed my attention and made me want to, to look more into this. And so I uh, actually uh, looked for Steve Jones, and I sought him out, and, uh, and we talked for a little bit. I wanted to get a feel for um, his sincerity and, uh, and his motivation for doing this, and so we talked a little bit. And uh, then I, I watched one of his uh, talks that he gave in September of 2005. Uh, at Brigham Young University, and we talked some more. And at that time, I was working as an electron microscopist. I was characterizing materials. Um, and I thought that I might have something to offer if, uh, if eventually he was to come across some evidence um, or, or evidence was sent to him. And so I offered um, what, what I could do um, to study that and to, to get some data on, on any of the evidence that he might collect. So uh, eventually, he was able to get some, uh, some metal samples that were, that were from some of the steel beams um, from one of the towers. And we studied those. Um, I cut up some of those steel samples and polished them to, to see what we would find in the steel. Um, some, of the, some of the pieces that, we, that, uh, that he acquired at the time had some corrosion. Uh, they'd obviously gone through some, uh, some melting. And uh, we thought that those might be significant. So we actually were looking. And I was going in that direction. That's sort of my expertise, um, solid state reactions. And, th and uh, that's not quite solid state necessarily. But, um, but that's certainly uh, in, the, uh, um, in the realm of my expertise. So that's the direction that I wanted to go, was to look at these materials, study the phases, and maybe see what temperatures that these, uh, these phases would have to, uh, uh, or the temperatures that the steel would have to get to to create these phases. Um, and then around 2006, I believe it was, um, uh, Steve started receiving dust samples and started looking at these dust samples. So uh, the study of the metal samples turned up um, different phases. Uh, uh, I did obviously see the, the, the steel phase and um, uh, iron oxide phases. Um, we did find uh, uh, an iron sulfide phase as well as um, an iron silicate phase. Uh, in all, uh, looking at all the phases, uh, I came to the conclusion that 
in order to create these phases, we'd have to, to reach a minimum of about 1,100 degrees C. So that was, um, that was some preliminary work um, that we did with these uh, steel samples that, or the, the, uh, the steel evidence that Steve was able to get from uh, various people. Um, in fact, one of the samples came from Clarkson University. Um, some, some of the steel beams had been sent out to Clarkson, or Clarkson College. Uh, and they were going to build a monument with these, and um, there was a lot of debris that was sent with the beams, and some of that evidence came from that debris, uh, as well as coming directly off of the steel columns. So um, that's where these initial samples came from. Um, obviously, it required uh, polishing these uh, these steel uh, these pieces of steel. Um, and then putting them in the electron microscope to find, and using x-ray analysis to find the, uh, the, uh, the chemistry. Um, I used uh, diffraction to determine the phase or the structure of the phases uh, along with the chemistry. Um, and, and in that way we were able to determine the phases that were in the steel or in these pieces of uh, steel that had been corroded or melted, uh, whatever the process they had gone through. Um, that's what we were trying to determine by looking at the phases. So, um, again, we found that uh, the phases that were there probably would require about 1,100 degrees C. Um, and that, uh, that didn't entirely wrap up that, that part of the study, but um, that, that, was, that was pretty significant findings. The, the question became, how do you get to those temperatures? Obviously, the question of how do you get to 1,100 degrees C is significant because you don't get to those temperatures with uh, scattered office fires uh, or even jet fuel fed fi office fires. You, don't, you, you get to maybe half that uh, temperature. So that, that, uh, that question of how do we get to 1100 degrees C, that, uh, that became fairly important to me and uh, one of the things that obviously get, uh, made me more motivated to, to look further into this. I don't know that I could, I could really speculate as to, I mean, there's, there's any number of sources of heat that could, that could create that temperature, but certainly not uh, jet fuel burning in open air in an office. Um, I guess what makes, this, uh, what makes these findings significant is, uh, well, it, it's sort of the manner in which we found them, uh, the way that they, the morphology, in other words, of, of the grains of these phases, you don't get uh, you don't you don't get these phases uh, with an oxyacetylene torch or or whatever torch you use to cut the steel. You don't get these phases um, existing together the way that we found them. Uh, so it's I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, people might say, well, they cut up the steel. Couldn't you create phases with a torch? Um, yeah, you probably could. I, I'm not going to deny that. I don't. You know, I mean, that's. Um, and if that's what, uh, it, if that ends that investigation, then, then I think what has to happen is you, you have to be able to take a torch and show that you can create these phases. And, and uh, so far, nobody's done that. So I don't know, you know, I'm not going to say that you can't do that. Um, we did find small amounts of aluminum in some of the, uh, in some of the specimens. Um, more significant probably was the sulfur content that we found. In fact, in one piece, um, I found a pore in the steel that, w that had pure sulfur uh, embedded in the pore, uh, which I thought was very strange. And um, so that's when I, I really started looking for sulfur in, in, and, and finding it in more abundance in some of these, fa in some of these phases. So then, of course, the, the next question is how do you get how do you get the sulfur um, in these uh, pieces of steel or, or in the debris? And, um, and that question is, is unanswered. Uh, there, are, there are possibilities for sulfur, I mean, any number of possibilities. Um, there is a, there's a version of thermite called thermate, which has uh, sulfur in the, in the thermate to, and what the, th what the sulfur does is it, it uh, it's sort of like um, salt on ice. It, it creates eutectic temperature, so it lowers the melting point of steel. And in that way, it can cut through the, uh, the thermate can cut through the steel or melt the steel 
more quickly um, than regular thermite. The finding of aluminum in these steel samples, or what used to be steel samples, um, also supports the theory that thermite was used to melt the steel. I would certainly love to get uh, an official sample of the steel uh, that we know came from a large piece of the steel. Uh, this was actually done by Jonathan Barnett. Um, he was contracted with FEMA or by FEMA to do this, and he, he actually took some of the um, some of the steel members and, and cut them up. And he, he selected some very significant pieces of steel. He, he t found ones that had um, oxidation or sulfidization uh, of the steel members. Uh, some of them looked like they'd been vaporized, definitely certainly melted. And he, would, uh, he cut up uh, portions of that steel at that, uh, at that point or at the locations where he saw the sulfidization. And, what he, and he found uh, similar things. He found iron sulfide uh, as one, in one phase. He found that the, the sulfur phases, or the, the phases rich in sulfur, were attacking the grain boundaries of the steel, which is exactly what uh, thermate would do. It would, it would go into the grain boundaries first to attack the steel and then melt the steel as it did that, uh, create that eutectic temperature. Uh, his findings were, were significant in that um, uh, he not only, this was, uh, he originally started with steel from Building 7, and his question was uh, then, do we find the same things happening in steel from Buildings 1 and 2, Towers 1 and 2? And uh, the answer to that was yes, they found very similar things to what they found in, building, in the steel of Building 7. And then the next question was, how much sulfur do you need to create these sulfur phases? He did some, some preliminary tests, and I think those were significant. And those are some tests that, that uh, if I had, the, if I had the, uh, the means, if I had the steel and, uh, and, and the time, I would, do these, I would like to do these tests. Uh, how much sulfur do you really need to create these uh, sulfide phases or these sulfur-rich phases? Some people have speculated that the sulfur could have been supplied by the wall board or the gypsum board that was uh, present in the buildings. Um, and I believe that's calcium sulfate, or uh, so it is a sulfate-rich phase. However, in order for that to happen, in order for you to to get sulfur out of the wall board, you've got to heat up the the gypsum board to high enough temperatures to uh, disasso or dissociate the calcium from from the sulfur, and then you'd have free sulfur and be able to, and then the sulfur could then attack the steel, uh, attack the iron phase or the the steel and create these sulfide phases uh, which go into the grain boundaries. Um, but again, you've got to get extremely high temperatures to dissociate those two things. And, uh, and then you'd have the temperature, and then certainly if you've got those temperatures, you've got the temperature to melt the steel. So, so this would require high temperatures, certainly higher temperatures than you get in normal office fires. So this is impossible to achieve in a normal office fire, even a jet fuel fed office fire you wouldn't achieve the temperatures required to dissociate the calcium and the sulfur in order for the sulfur to then attack the grain boundaries of the steel and melt the steel.